revealed in upcoming episodes of this program are the contents of a recently unearthed repository classified by the secret government, the Phenomenon Archive. Noted author H.P. Lovecraft wrote, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Tales of haunted houses and ghosts have been the cause of many a child's sleepless night. But once upon a time, claiming you could communicate with the deceased could cause you a lot of trouble. You could be cast out or even burnt at the stake. While you may not be among the 45 million in the U.S. who believe in ghosts, what would be your reaction if a visitor from the other side were to suddenly enter your life? Whatever we're dealing with, it possessed the ability to kill. <sighs> Are you okay, buddy? Oh, Shit. God. And I remember feeling these eyes looking at me. It was as if somebody was right behind me, just looking right at me. The balls of light seem to have a purpose and name. All we can tell you is what we've seen and experienced and recorded. I'm so scared and I don't even know why. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. After the stock market crash of 1929 in a rapidly expanding shipping port known as Los Angeles Harbor, a man is brutally murdered. Though the details of his death are sketchy, 60 years later, the spirit of the victim of this unresolved crime will take his case to a single mom in a little clappered house just a few miles down the way. Whether he's searching for justice, Vengeance or some form of resolution to his death is unknown to the people in this story. But before he's through, they will know a lot more about him, themselves, and the life that lurks on the other side of darkness. I had always been the type of person who's always been afraid to be alone. Um, I wasn't afraid of ghosts. I was afraid of people breaking into my house. But um, for some reason in this house, which was a very easy house to break into, if you looked at it, I was not afraid. And I felt that some kind of presence, but I never really thought about it. The presence Jackie felt in the house would soon turn into something more. I remember the very first thing that happened was when I walked by my desk, a, and Al was sitting at the desk, and a friend of mine was sitting on the couch. And it, when I walked by the desk, I wasn't close to it. I was a couple feet away. But it was as if this thing came tumbling at me uh, with a pencil holder and the pencils came out. And I knew I didn't touch it. In February 1989, the haunting would become even more terrifying. She observed the apparition of an old man sitting on this bunk bed in her children's bedroom. Every time I've seen him, he's always been cross-legged. He's got a grayish uh, tone to him and he's wearing a red flannel shirt and his, his shirt is tucked in, his pants are high waters and they're like um, dull gasoline, gas attendance pants. Not long after, this painting suddenly flew across the room and landed on the kitchen countertop. Susan Castaneda, Jackie's neighbor, claims to have personally witnessed paranormal phenomena within the home. I don't know what it is, but I saw it and I smelled it. I experienced it, I felt it, it touched me, it talked to me, it communicated to me. While in her presence, this lamp suddenly took off from a small table and crashed to the floor. I heard a big 
thump. I thought a bookcase had fallen. One night when Jackie went out of town, her friend, Darlene, agreed to babysit her two small children, Samantha and Jamie. When I looked in, from the living room to the bedroom, it looked like it was so far away, you know, and then I heard a voice saying, don't come in here. It was real spooky, you know, real scary. It made me feel like it would be violent if I did, you know, go into the restroom. Don't come in here. Jackie grew restless as the days wore on. On another occasion, Jackie observed a stream of water mysteriously pouring out of this light switch. She was pregnant at the time and she would tell me these things and I'd just say, yeah, uh huh, you know. Well, if you feel comfortable feeling that something is there or a presence or whatever looking out for you, then it can't be evil because you feel it's looking out for you. And I thought it was Jackie's own confidence in herself for the first time in her life that she didn't feel afraid being in that house until it's, the manifestations really started. Jackie Hernandez heard from a friend that a group of parapsychologists who seemed to take their work very seriously had recently appeared on television. Jackie looked into the matter and made contact with the group. Her call got three men involved, a videographer, Barry Conrad, a still photographer, Jeff Wheatcraft, and a well-known researcher in the field of paranormal activity, Barry Taft. Taft and his former associate researched the classic 1974 case made famous in the movie The Entity. On the night of August 8th, 1989, um, Barry Conrad, Jeff Weavecraft, Larry Brooks, and myself went out to the San Pedro home of Jackie Hernandez for the first time. And we interviewed her at great length. Uh, the cameras were set up. We did some shooting, did some, a lot of walking around the house to see whatever we could feel. The first thing that was apparent was there was a very peculiar odor to the house, uh, a foul stench reminiscent very similar to the entity case that occurred back in 1974. I was a tremendous skeptic, I guess, but what happened to me was uh, something way beyond what I'd ever thought that, that, that could possibly happen. So we thought they would come out there and they wouldn't see anything. And Jeff came in, he was very quiet. And um, I didn't even know he was a photographer until uh, they, they interviewed us and, uh, and uh, we told them everything we'd seen it to that point and then uh, they decided to walk through the house. I'm sitting there listening to her interview and she's talking about disembodied heads and things in the attic. I felt something behind me so I kind of like, I, I turned real quick and as I turned there was a head and it was just a head and it was coming for me, right towards me and I just freaked and just fell. And I'm thinking, yeah, right, uh, you know, very doubtful that anything like this would, would actually occur, that any, anybody would see it. And that's when I ask, uh, you know, let, let's see the attic, let's, let's go up there, or at least open the attic door and, and see what we can find. Fascinated by Jackie's account of the disembodied head, the group decided to inspect the house. Just above this laundry room is the entrance to the attic. Jeff Wheatcraft decided to go up and shoot a couple of photos. I went up into the attic and checked it out. It's a very small attic, it's very simple. There's nothing up there, basically. But you know, as I walked around, I felt like there was something looking at me. You know how you get this feeling where something's looking at you or something's behind you? Larry Brooks asked him what he would think about going back up into the attic and taking shots with his camera over his shoulder. I started clicking off some photos. It was dark, totally dark. I fired first, I fired second, and just as I fired into the third frame, something pulled this camera from my hands. And we all hear this scream. We hear Jeff just this, this loud scream. And everybody, you know, instantly runs to the kitchen, which is right there by the laundry room. And we see Jeff. Jeff comes out of the attic, and he looks as white as a ghost himself. He was shaking. I go back up there with lights this time, with a flashlight. I don't see my camera in the position that I was. I look back in the corner. All of a sudden, I see just the lens sitting there. In the corner, in the other corner of the attic, was the body of the camera lying 
upside down with the lens port, the lens port laying straight down into a box, you know, just an old crate that was in the attic. When Barry Conrad went up with Jeff into the attic that night, um, a couple things had happened. First, his camera uh, would die as soon as he went up into the attic. You, the, it would just quit. But when he brought it down, it would work. It wouldn't work up there, but it would work down below. And the other thing that happened, apparently, right in front of Barry Conrad, Jeff was pushed by this thing. And I felt this force pushing my back, like a huge hand just pushing, pushing, pushing my back. I witnessed it, right? And you were right there. Barry was looking directly at me, and he saw my <gasps> face. I saw his body kind of uh, shaking. He grabbed onto a rafter. It wasn't like somebody just touched you. It was like a push, a bony hand that pushed me down. Right in here, he was, he was probably like right here. And I, I didn't dare look behind me. I was frightened at that point, and I didn't dare look behind me. But here Barry's looking at me and wondering what in the world is going on. A few moments after Jeff and Barry left the attic, loud pounding noises began to emanate from the ceiling. And the whole feeling of the room just changed. It was, it went from all of a sudden from being just an interview to something that was actually happening. I mean, this, this was actually happening and nobody could explain it. Whatever. It's like, it's something grabbed that out of my hand. I am not kidding, somebody grabbed the whole thing out of my hand. Just now, just, just now, now, just yeah. now. It grabbed the whole thing out of my hand. Yeah. Is okay. Hear it? 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 Were you ever pushed that hard? Well, that thing I was, hard. I was pushed hard. I was pushed hard on two occasions, very hard, where I could feel the imprint of the hand on my back. Now convinced that a ghost was indeed present in Jackie's attic, Jeff peered once more into the eerie blackness. The atmosphere grew tense and silent. Ooh! A light, a light, a light, a light. I, I get on top of the wash machine, I'm looking up into the attic, and I see three flashes of light. I just saw the bright light, probably about as big as this, this lens opening here, and then I saw, the last thing I saw was a pinpoint, just a real little pinpoint of light. Then, after the three flashes of light, I'm thinking, maybe, is it, maybe I'll see something more. All of a sudden, it's dark, and I see a black mass moving in the attic. What? Sorry, what? <laughs> There's something moving in the darkness, and I can just see it move. It's huge. Barry? It Barry, is. you said you saw something moving in the darkness. So, Monica, get up here. Can you put your head through? There's the light again. But recently, it's been getting a little bit destructive, and tonight was the most active it has ever been. It's fearful of something. It doesn't want you to be here. It's, I can sense that. From black shadows moving in the dimly lit attic to unexplainable flashes of light, something unusual was happening here. When the photographer's film was developed the next day, an unusual orb of light appeared in the lower corner of one of the frames. Books on the supernatural are filled with accounts of strange lights, but no book could adequately explain what happened in the Hernandez house that night or what was going to happen. Everyone just left except us in the house. Things are starting to drip out of the cabinets. Nobody believes us, but it's happening, right, Jeff? There it is. There it is, right there. Unbelievable. The first night we were at the Hernandez house, um, Jackie told us about some viscous liquid dripping and oozing from various parts of the house. But we took some of the, I guess, liquid ooze, for lack of a better term, uh, back to a lab to have it analyzed. Upon analysis, it was determined this was human blood plasma with a high copper and iodine content, and it was m male blood. They tried to figure out a logical solution for, you know, why it was happening or possibly coming from a pipe or, or what, what it could possibly be coming from other than just the walls, but there was no logical explanation. 
Uh, we have no explanation for how this type of fluid, bodily fluid, could be present uh, anywhere outside of a human body except perhaps in a laboratory. How it got in the walls, we know we, for, for a fact that there were no bodies stuffed in the wall. Uh, this sounds like a bad movie, it sounds like a bad novel, but this was anything but, and uh, it occurred repeatedly, it wasn't just one occasion. This is Jackie. It's uh, 10.30 Monday morning. Uh, I got a picture of it. I think I got about three or four good shots of it. It's going around on the kitchen ceiling, and there's a white film of smoke up there, and I don't know where the smoke is coming from, but I got the lights that have been zooming around. There's been light beams that are the, dancing around on the ceiling, and then there was also a shape form. There's a little light that was going around and around and around real, real fast. And by this time, it was all clumped here, and it would, it would divide, and it would go back together, and it was like little jelly balls. Pretty soon, um, they were going like, like little kites or little fishtails, polywogs, just real super fast across the, all the way across over here and back, arching. When the balls of light were on the ceiling, it was very frightening. I would, had just woken up from a night's sleep, and I looked up on the ceiling, and there were these lights flying around. And my first reaction was like, oh my god, what is this? What is this? I want to get out of here. And in the meantime, Jackie was just taking pictures. Jackie took the film to this photo lab. Chuck McAdams and Martha Houston, owners of the shop, were skeptical when Jackie told them her story. But looking at the prints and what we've seen from it, it was weird. I mean, the patterns and the lights that we saw from this is a little unusual. It's not that you can say this is a particular item, but it doesn't really match what should be in a print like this. They were um, very bright and luminous. All the blinds in the kitchen were shut, so it wasn't from the outside sun sunlight. Um, they were round and just like they looked like they would jiggle and they would move around a little bit and break apart and come back together. I heard it breathe last night. Awesome. You heard it breathe again, huh? When I heard that, Barry, I said, I am not staying in this house and I'm not going to sleep in this house. I can tell you that because I wouldn't want to meet up with what made that noise. What's going to happen next? What's it going to do to me? You know? It's just, it's getting very hard to even be here. I feel like just packing up the kids and going to Texas right now. I'm really scared. Up to this point, professional curiosity was what kept the research group involved. But after what you're about to see, the haunting in San Pedro became more than just another ghost story. In fact, for photographer Jeff Wheatcraft, it became a matter of life and death. Right now I'm feeling totally drained, <laughs> totally tired, and totally on edge, and I feel like going up there and killing it again. I'm about to snap on it, and then it'll probably snap back. I couldn't take being in that house any longer. Um, Barry had spent a few nights over at the house uh, trying to get, trying to investigate it more, and he was exhausted. I was exhausted, and he went, he, you know, he left, and that night, that day, just things started happening. We receive a frantic, and I do mean frantic, call from Jackie Hernandez. I'm not staying here, Barry. I'm not here. I gotta get out of here. I can't stay here. The objects were being thrown across the room. The kids' toys were being levitated off the ground. I was just ready to, like, uh, just jump in the truck and just drive until I ran out of gas because I had no money at that at that time. I just wanted to get as far away from the house as possible. Jackie. When Barry and Jeff got there, I thought that they were going to come pick me up and we were going to leave. That wasn't the case. They get out of the van, they had their video equipment, and they come running in like they, you know, were going ghost busting. I've heard moaning, I've heard voices in the attic, I've heard breathing coming from both the bedroom and the kitchen. Balls went flying through the air today. A book went through the air today. 
just like it just like a frisbee um the door closed on me slammed on me all of a sudden well, i met barry conrad in high school uh, i was a freshman he was a senior and we became friends then and uh, were friends for some years after that and i just happened to be part of this crew and just happened to be there on the night uh, when this phone call came in and uh, uh, you know, looking at it now, I still don't know what to believe. I just know what I had seen and experienced, and they were things that I'd certainly never seen before and couldn't be explained by you know, any ordinary you know, science or anyone else. At first glance, everything seemed calm. After carefully checking the bedroom and bathroom, Jeff and Gary decided to venture into the attic. Well, I guess I'm going to go up, and then uh, Jeff's going to come up and check out what's happening tonight. Yep, you okay? I'm fine. I feel a little queasy about going up there, but then I guess I'll go up. If I got a partner, why? It's so bad. It was the first time in nearly a month that Jeff had been to the house. Memories of that night undoubtedly still haunted him. Memories of an invisible presence. A presence which had literally touched him. Barry had the video equipment downstairs. He was ready to come up. I wanted to check around the attic just to see if there was anything unusual that had been moved or anything that had been placed around or whatever. At 12.50 a.m., Wheatcraft and Bame climbed into the attic. As Jeff and I entered the attic, I remember feeling maybe just a little bit apprehensive, not really knowing what to expect or expect anything at all. It is, it's a wimpy thing. It comes out when I'm here long, and then when people are here, it doesn't come out. We only had two things with us. Uh, Jeff had handed me a camera, just a small little 35 millimeter camera, and Jeff had a flashlight. Barry, on the other hand, did not go up into the attic because since the first night that it messed with the video camera and wouldn't work up there. I remember spending probably just maybe five or 10 minutes up in the attic. All of a sudden, Barry Conrad looks up into the hole and he says, I think there might be something happening down here. We hear something. There was a sound in my left ear, and I'll never forget this. It just sent chills down my spine and it sounded like someone snapping her fingers. It was just as plain as day, and it sounded just like this. What's it doing? You know, Jeff, I'm I, snapping. I fully intended to come back here and tell you I didn't think this was a good idea for you to go up there. Just like that, just like somebody just snapped their fingers right in front of your face. And I looked at Barry, who had the camera, and I looked at Jackie, and Jackie looked at me. We all looked at each other like, who did that? Who did it? And all of us at that instant said, it's down here, come down, come down, come down out of the attic, because we were very frightened. After Conrad shouted for them to come downstairs, Bame approached the opening. Wheatcraft, still near the center of the attic, prepared to take one step. It was the one step he'd never forget. What's wrong? What happened? There was a moment, momentary space in there where everything went black. Jeff Wheatcraft was physically attacked in this attic on September 4th, 1989 by an invisible force that actually pulled him up onto a nail protruding from a rafter beam and actually tried to strangle him to death. I don't be remember being lifted up there, but I was actually hung. He had a horrible time getting Jeff down from there and those were very anxious um, moments that passed because we didn't know whether to go up there or what. We knew something happened. Gee, this isn't a good idea. This isn't a good idea. This this isn't a good idea. idea. He was over like at a 45 degree angle and he, he was wrapped, entirely wrapped around one of the, the slats holding the, the roof up. I mean his legs, I mean he was like basically off the, off the floor because his legs were wrapped around this beam. It was like he was like wrapped around there holding onto this thing for dear life. Uh, the expression on his face though indicated almost like he didn't even know what was going on. That was like one thing that impressed me about the expression on his face. And can you imagine just coming out of that, that dark space of time that I lost? I mean, I felt so out of control. Uh, the thing I remember most about the, the hanging incident with Jeff Recraft was, was just how fast it happened. I mean, it was in just, just a fraction of a second. I had taken maybe two or three steps away from him, and then bang, you know, he had called out, and there he was. He was like very, very stiff. And again, I couldn't figure out why was he there in this position. So it wasn't until I got like right up on him and looked from like the side that I could see that, uh, that this rope was around his neck. It was this clothesline cord the ghost used in its attempt to strangle Jeff Wheatcraft. And this is where the mystery deepens. Where did the cord come from? 
According to the researchers, the attic had been thoroughly searched only a few days before. All they found were these seashells along with a horseshoe. What I remember was Jeff coming down and he, he, he just looked so terrified. Come right now, Jeff, what happened? Put something around my neck. Look at his oh, shit. Oh, my God. He was scared. Oh, Jeff, here you go, buddy. Here you go. Here you go. What happened? Are you okay, buddy? Oh, shit. Oh, God. Look at his neck. Oh. Look, Jeff, look, come on. what's behind your neck? I don't know what's on my come neck. On, come on, down. Come on, down. A piece of rope. Oh, shit. Gary, get down out of there, buddy. I knew you should. Can you find my glasses? Gary. Glasses. Jeff. Look at this. Jeff. Oh. Look at Jeff. this. Turn Jeff, the camera. Jeff, are you okay? Jeff. I'm fine. Jeff. Tell me what happened, buddy. Well, I don't know, Gary. I told Gary that there was nothing happening up there, and he turned around and came. He was coming this way. All of a sudden, I feel, feel this thing around my neck, and it's got me hanging, hanging, and it's pulling on my leg. You were hanging? Yeah, I was hanging. Neck? Gary had to bring me down. What has happened, actually? I'm here, I'm pulled to the side of the attic, and there's nobody up there, and I know that Gary's standing there, and, you know, he has nothing to do with it. He's at a distance from me. I see the flash from his camera, I remember that. And I know he said something to me, but I don't recall exactly what he said. Look at this. Look at this. Look at his neck. Oh my God. If I had not been there, he would have strangled. And he would have probably died there in that attic if I had not been here to get him down because he didn't know what was going on. And it was wrapped so tightly that, uh, I mean, I couldn't get him off of that, of the, uh, the nail. It was over a nail. And I found I had to actually bend the nail down straight to even get the rope off of it. Yeah, it was up my feet and it hung me on something. Oh, Gary, on Gary had to pull me off. Look at this. I don't want to go through it again. In the 110 year formal history of psychical research, there's been less than a handful of people that have been deliberately harmed or injured in some way by this phenomena. In fact, only one really well-established case. So this might be the second one. And if it was not for one of our other associates present in the attic, Jeff might have been killed. Um, this is very, different than what we're used to experiencing. People get frightened by anything they don't understand, but to have it directly attack somebody repeatedly is something that we really can't understand. And it suggests strongly that this phenomena is interacting with us. It's not some form of uh, psychic projection, just some random force acting out of nature. It take, it's discreet and it seems to know what it's doing. The hanging incident proved to be just one event of several that occurred that night. The horrors of that night never ended. I remember right after Jeff had been hung in the attic, I'm standing there and I'm looking through the viewfinder of my camera trying to document all of this, and suddenly a ball of light appeared in the viewfinder, yet it wasn't in front of the camera lens. And at that point, a surge of electricity or energy or something went through my body, and at that point I blacked out. All of a sudden, he pulled his eye away quick like that and he looked at us. He got the strangest look on his face. He just, just, it, it was like that he was just fading out. Wheatcraft, shaken by his experience, began to suffer a series of headaches and later sat on the porch to recover from his ordeal. Just a, just a tremendous headache just really hit me strong, real strong. I've never had one come on, you know, that bad. It maybe has something to do with the pressure on my neck, I don't know. Concern for the safety of her children prompted Jackie to move them onto the porch as well. Her four-month-old daughter, Samantha, was photographed as you see her at approximately 1.40 a.m. I had passed her a few times, and every time I looked down at both of the kids to make sure that they were okay, because I was very worried about them. And I had even asked, or, you know, sit, t told it and demanded that it stay away from my children in no uncertain terms. In fact, that night, that same night in the bedroom, I said, just stay away from my kids. And I went back into the kitchen to get something else. And as I, when, when I came back out again, I looked down at her and she had a big red, a big red imprint or something right in the middle of her forehead. I don't know, look at what's on me. Guys, let's go, please let's go. Please let's go, please, what happened to her? It freaked me out because it came so close to my kids. And it was almost as if it was saying to me, hey, I can do what I want to. Don't tell me that not to mess with your kids because if I want to, I will. 
just exactly what the substance was on the forehead of Jackie's four-month-old baby will never be known. In her panic to be sure that her child was okay, she wiped the mark away. But this incident, combined with the violent attacks on Wheatcraft, left Jackie and the others afraid for their lives. That night they left the house for good. Although Wheatcraft would never set foot in the San Pedro house again, it was by no means his last encounter with the phenomenon. If I had stayed in that house, I would have had a nervous breakdown, or I just, I couldn't see going on because I was just, it was, I was at my wit's end. When the research team traveled back to Conrad's apartment, Barry was anxious to view the videotape recorded earlier. While looking at a shot of Wheatcraft in the kitchen, Conrad made a startling discovery. A bright comet of light shot through the doorway behind Jeff. I didn't see these again with my naked eye, but when I look back on the monitor in the studio, we started seeing these little comets of light at moving at very, very rapid rates of speed through the frame. Later on during our investigation, we found many more of these lights, which led us to believe that this was some kind of unknown form of energy. The phenomena it's displaying, beside the psychokinetic manifestations of objects moving, it's displaying visual materialization is the sense of um, corpuscular masses of light, like balls of light, similar like, say, an almost fireball lightning, that these aren't in any way, as they do not occur in this part of the world to begin with. But it seems to be following the woman, it manifests these corpuscular masses of light, and it seems to be malevolent or belligerent in nature, which the entity certainly was. Whether this is the same thing or something analogous to it, we don't know, but it's unique because the phenomena seems to be directional. It's aimed, it's focused, it's not some random force, we just happen to be there. It seems to go after certain things with a specific intention behind its actions. Some of the more spectacular lights that I photographed were lights that occurred later on in the case. We recorded a sort of pea pod looking light. It looked like an object with three little cotton balls in it and it actually traveled throughout the frame and it disappeared for a frame, actually blinked out for a frame and one object actually entered her head. Barry didn't show me this film footage right away. He took him a while before I finally got to see it because they were afraid of what my reaction to it would be, which was th that of fear. It freaked me out to think that this thing was inside of me or that these lights were going inside of me. It's, it was bad enough having them around me. As far as insects go, there's nothing that would be that bright and that glowing. Uh, also, there's doesn't the appearance of the shadows and things like that, it just doesn't seem right. These things seem to be self-illuminated. So insects outside of fireflies, which don't occur here, are not self-illuminating. These lights are much more um, uh, focused in a line. They curve very, very um, easily. Insects tend to be much more herky-jerky, more um, scattered in the way they go, tend to flutter much more and uh, go slow and fast at the same time. This was very constant in its speed. Parapsychologists believe that these lights may represent a major breakthrough in the study of ghosts. The most, uh, I guess, impressive thing that I saw in all of Barry's tapes that I saw was this phenomena of these streaks of light. Basically taking all of them uh, into account, and I saw maybe uh, two dozen or three dozen events over maybe six hours worth of tapes, is that there's no real logical explanation for them. I'm convinced that they emit their own light, number one. They all have a very smooth flight path. Bugs, insects are very jerky in their motion. These were all very well-defined paths. And they all had basic characteristics that were common. I personally, looking at them, cannot explain what they are. Both emotionally and physically drained as a result of her ordeal, Jackie and her children were forced to leave their home. She moved to Weldon, California, nearly 300 miles north of San Pedro. Jackie felt a certain sense of serenity as she and her family adapted to life in this modest mobile home. Set amidst the foothills of the high Sierras, Weldon seemed like a perfect place to raise her children. 
But all of that changed in April 1990 as her worst fears were realized. It started here in this storage shed. Bizarre scratching sounds seemed to emanate from the structure in the middle of the night. Not long after, she began to see the weird lights again. And then, in late March 1990, this bedspread in her daughter's room mysteriously caught fire after Jackie and a friend had sighted an eerie black shape floating in the hallway. As was the case in San Pedro, Jackie's experience with the poltergeist would be shared by her new neighbors as well. And we heard three knocks very loud in the baby's bedroom, and it was like a force was trying to get out. And it was just, it would go three times, and it would stop, and it would go three more times. And I was freaked out. When it got dark and I was alone, I still would, would have to wrestle with myself, and I was still going through the ordeal, I guess the after effects or whatever, of being, of what had happened to me before. I was still traumatized, I guess you would say. I'm so scared and I don't even know why. Everybody who walked in my house had experienced something. And it was, it was very scary. And uh, I was telling Barry uh, over the phone what was going on as it was happening and he couldn't believe it, and he wanted to come up and see for himself what was going on. I guess a lot of people have asked the question, if you were hung once and uh, all the things that happened to you down in San Pedro, why on earth would you even think about going up to Weldon to follow this woman and her ghost? And. Uh, I guess the best way to answer that is I wanted to finish this case. I saw a black shadow move right from here on up to about right here. I guess about right up in here from the distance perspective it was. And then it moved off like this. So it came up like this, moved up like this. Right behind you I saw like a purple, like violet flash of light. And then it's just like flash and that was it. And Jackie over here saw it too. So I don't know. That's about the first time I've seen it at this house, but it's weird. What is this image doing in Weldon, California, flying into a storage shed behind Jackie Hernandez's new home? We don't know. But further on in the evening, it got even more perplexing. Uh, for lack of anything better to do, waiting for phenomena to occur, hoping to perhaps encourage it, Barry and Jackie and Jeff began using a Ouija board with some of Jackie's neighbors. Within those next few hours, astonishing paranormal activities would occur. The four participants took their seats around the table, and before long, they were introduced to an awesome spectacle of supernatural power. Within minutes, the table would begin to shake violently, and the perpetrator of the haunting episodes would finally make itself known to one and all. He tells the group who he is, where he comes from, what happened to him in life, and most interestingly of all, what he is after in death. The information he gives helps Conrad and Wheatcraft uncover important information about their phantom aggressor. Right away, things started happening. The table started shaking. Uh, it started answering questions so fast that you had to write down the letters, and you, I, we didn't know what it was saying until after all the letters were written down and we could put together the words that the letters form. We received more than just messages from this entity. There was a whole range of psychokinetic phenomena at work in this room. At times it would shake very violently and the candles would flicker on and off and it was just strange. And I seen that pointer on the board moving around and everybody could barely keep their fingers on it. This thing actually communicated in full sentences and words. I have never seen anything like it. I've seen people play the Ouija board before where maybe you get just a couple uh, letters here and there that are similar to something that you can kind of make out. This thing actually spelled perfectly, correctly, special words, everything was perfect. During the Ouija board session, the entity actually answered questions asked by the group. The researchers were startled when the entity told them that he had been murdered, held underwater in San Pedro Bay in 1930. And when asked how many ghosts reside among the living, it spelled out 
phantoms fill the skies around you. This night was incredible. We were like, it seemed like direct communication with whatever was talking with us. We're sitting there, this ta table's vibrating. We just had a feeling something was going to give, and it did. I ask it, why are you focusing your energy on me? Why me? Because you killed me! Intrigued by what he had seen, Barry Conrad decided to visit the news pilot, the local San Pedro newspaper. While searching through records of old newspapers stored on microfilm, Conrad discovered an interesting article dating back to 1930, the year the entity claimed it had been murdered. The body of Herman Hendrickson was discovered near the 22nd Street landing. When his body was found, authorities believed he may have met with foul play. According to the death certificate, examination of the body revealed a compound fracture to the skull. Due to lack of evidence, however, the man's death was ruled accidental. Herman Hendrickson was a seaman. He worked on this ship, the Astoria, a lumber steamer commissioned by the Hammond Lumber Company back in the 30s. There was some kind of a link here to something beyond, beyond the grave. But we found a man in the newspaper that correlated to the information that we had received through the Ouija board that someone had been murdered, perhaps, held underwater. Indeed, the entity said he'd been held underwater. After discovering the death of Hendrickson, a question was raised about the knot used in the hanging of Jeff Wheatcraft. Whoever made that knot knew what he was doing. He was connected some way with the ocean. Back in the 30s, they all used it. It's been used for hundreds of years. Well, here's your bowling. That is a very common knot. It's used every, every day by seamen, by fishermen. There's an old pirate expression. The sea does not give up her secrets easily. That may certainly be said for our friend Herman Henriksen. His mystery began 60 years ago, the night someone fractured his skull and dropped his body in the waterway not far from Jackie's house. Apparently, Herman wasn't satisfied with letting his murder go unavenged. He came back to find the man he hated, the one that held him underwater, the man that ended his young life. When this case began in the summer of 1989, no one could have predicted its longevity. Poltergeist activity is usually short-lived. Although today, the phenomena has greatly diminished, Jackie Hernandez believes that whatever was following her has not completely gone away. Today, not much is, not, there's not, hard, there's hardly any phenomenon. It's, I'm not afraid anymore. In hindsight, I, I can say it now, where I couldn't say it when I was going through it, but I almost feel fortunate to have had the opportunity to see the other side, although there's a lot that I would have preferred not to have seen, but it was an experience that not too many people get to go through, and even though I didn't want to at the time and I was terrified, I feel, I feel fortunate to have uh, experienced the things that I've experienced. Were spirits of the dead responsible for haunting Jackie Hernandez and the others, or was it some other freak of nature? Strange colored mists, blood plasma, balls of light, and an attempted hanging are strangely linked to a mysterious story about a tragic seaman who at a young age was violently struck down. Aren't these grounds for believing that something beyond the grave is waiting, hoping to be heard, to meet out his final destiny and finally escape the obscurity shared so long with the Phenomenon Archive?